So I'm, it, my talk today is a kind, of, kind of a departure from the ones that we've heard over the past uh, day and a half because I'm not going to be speaking about my own research, which in a way is about um, a, a, you know, relations between the province and the center. Um, I, I work mainly on merchants, long distance merchants um, in Egypt between the late 18th and the early 19th century. So I was really preoccupied with this question of centralization, relations with Istanbul, etc. But I'm not going to be speaking about that today. Um, instead, I thought it, it would have been possible to speak about you know, Egypt seen by eyewitnesses like Abdul Rahman al Jabarti, he's one of the main chroniclers of the late 18th, early 19th century, or Nicola Turk, who talks about the French expedition. But instead, I thought that it might be um, useful or, or different to talk about the differences between recent historiographies of the province and particularly those that emerged in the 20th century, or, or the late 20th and the, the early 21st. And we can divide these for simplicity's sake into two main perspectives, one that sees Egypt primarily as a province of the empire, and one that sees the empire primarily as a power in Egypt. So, okay, of course this classification is very simplistic, and it discounts myriad uh, differences or nuances in emphasis in methodology and political persuasion, um, that underlie different approaches to the history of Egypt. I will give you a first pretty picture to look at. That's the Mosque of Sinan Pasha in Bulaq. It's not relevant really to the talk, but it's something nice to distract you from what I'm saying. Um, so Jane Hathaway, she's someone who wrote a con considerable number of works about Ottoman Egypt. She wrote, among others, an article titled Rewriting 18th Century Ottoman History. And she does actually a very good job of giving kind of a survey of the field, so I'm not going to repeat what she's already done. And she also teases out uh, the differences among some of the principal scholars in the field. But one of the lacunae in um, this article and in her work generally, I think, is that she doesn't really refer to any historians who publish in Arabic. And that's significant, as you will see in a moment, uh, to the topic of uh, my talk. So um, in particular, Hathaway alludes only in passing and with some disparagement to a scholar called Nelly Hanna. And full disclosure, Nelly Hanna was my master's thesis supervisor. So I, I can't perhaps be said to be totally unbiased towards her. But she's also a very prominent uh, historian of Ottoman Egypt today, perhaps one of the most prominent writing um, at the moment. And she's known for, um, I think rigorous research. She's also known for a very compelling style, so her books tend to appeal to quite a wide audience. And she's very prolific in her output, so every couple of years she, um, she will publish a book. Um, and she is interested mainly in what she calls the middle strata of urban society. So she's written a history of Bulaq, uh, which, Bulaq, which was Cairo's main port during the um, Ottoman period. She's written a book uh, titled Habité au Caire on housing uh, types and the social dimensions of domestic architecture in Ottoman Cairo. Here are some, here's another picture. One second, I'll, I'll come back to these because they're pretty, but I want to show you there are two covers of her books. Um, and she's written the biography of a 16th century Cairo merchant named Ismail Abu Taqiyya, among others. I won't go into them exhaustively. Uh, most recently, a work titled Ottoman Egypt in the Emergence of the Modern World, 1500 to 1800. And this is kind of where her uh, research is going these days. Um, and if we take her work as an example of how the provinces view the empire, that is actually not the most important question for her. How, how Egypt saw the Ottomans is not something that comes up, in fact, very often in her work. Um, she, I think, following the lead of André Raymond, who is her predecessor and her professor and someone who uh, published a, what we could call a magnum opus on artisans and merchants in Ottoman uh, Cairo. She follows his example, but she's published sort of more detailed and more numerous uh, works of scholarship, maybe more focused as well. Um, but both of them used Egypt as a kind of prism through which to see um, a number of notions, and in Nelly Hanna's case in particular, through which to challenge a number of notions. In particular, the notion that modernity emerged in Europe before it did so elsewhere in the world. So today this is kind of a cliche, and it's kind of something that we've surpassed, but it's important, I think, not to forget that um, in, in the wake of someone like Janet Abu Lorod, uh, Nelly Hanna was really path-breaking in, in developing that question long before we came to take for granted the idea that there can be different uh, paces of uh, historical tra transformation, different modes of transformation, and different trajectories as well. 
So a lot of her scholarship has been committed to overturning this paradigm of Western superiority. Um, and, and one could see her work and that of André Raymond as paving the way for the work of historians like Kenneth Kuno, who also worked on Egypt um, in the 19th century, or in a very different way, someone like Peter Gran. I don't know if people are familiar with him, but he, he published a, a book that was very influential in its time called, um, oh my goodness, something about the, the 18th century roots of capitalism mm -hmm. and um, Islamic the Islamic roots of capitalism, exactly. So there was, you know, it, it was based on this idea that in the 18th century, Egypt is undergoing a capitalist transformation, but then the processes that occur in the 19th century come and put an end uh, to that transformation. So um, it would be possible to use the, the findings of all of these historians to argue or to uphold the idea that you have economic and cultural changes that are occurring totally independently of European influence or European um, intervention or even to a large extent European inspiration until the 18th century. And again, just to contextualize, these are people who are publishing in a place and at a time where the general idea is that when the French came to Egypt in 1798, they brought modernity with them, like in a basket. Um, maybe, maybe Peter Gran is an outlier, and that's why I asked if uh, people are aware of his work, because he based his contentions about capitalist transformation on a kind of idiosyncratic analysis, he used grammar texts and, and dictionaries and encyclopedias to make this argument that certain kinds of, certain approaches to grammar or certain methodologies like encyclopedic writing go along with capitalist transformation. But there was perhaps a, a missing link, a missing causal link. But in all of these cases, all the historians that I've mentioned, shared this conviction that um, the processes of state building and administrative centralization that took place in the 19th century transformed and in fact stifled the autonomous processes of change that were taking place. And you know they, they can base this on references, for example, to people like Ali Bek Kibir or Mohammed Bey Abul Dahab, who were kind of the big Mamluk Beys at the end of the 18th century, that who carried out uh, reforms that were in many ways precursors of the reforms of Muhammad Ali or Mehmet Ali, as many of you know him, and that's another thing that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so in the field of law, for example, there's another scholar called Amira Sombol, who maintains that um, you had before the 19th century in Egypt a great deal of flexibility in approaches to the law, you could go to different courts, you could appeal to qadis from different madhabs, from different um, legal schools, to obtain the decision that basically suited the type of case that you were bringing. And in the 19th century, she makes the argument that codification happens, and this kind of shuts down opportunities, especially for vulnerable populations like women or minors or slaves. So all of this scholarship, um, at least in the case of André Raymond, Ali Hanna, Kenneth Kuno, and Amira Sombol, who's the last person I mentioned, they all relied on a source that is now well known to historians, and this is mainly due to André Raymond, because he's really one of the first people to have exploited it so extensively, and that is the uh, registers of the courts that the Ottoman state established throughout Egypt starting shortly after the conquest in 1517. So particularly in the 17th and the 18th centuries, these uh, registers contain a mind-boggling number of cases on a very wide variety of subjects um, because, as we know, the courts, at least in Egypt, served the function of a notary public as well as doing um, judicial work. I'll show the picture um, a little bit later. Actually, we can look at something more pleasant right now. Here, we can look at the Sabil um, Kuteb of Abdul Rahman Katkhoda. This is a, a building, an Ottoman period building that is particularly beautiful. So. Can, you can rest your eyes on that. Um, so the, I'm not going to talk about the contents of these cases um, on which the historians that I've mentioned base their findings um, because they're beyond the scope of my paper and I'm sure that they're familiar to, to most of you. But overall, they serve to buttress this argument that there was considerable dynamism in Egyptian society and that this dynamism could kind of be analyzed independently of Ottoman directives and independently of European stimuli. So um, in this regard, many of the historians who worked on the 18th century that I've just mentioned can and possibly should be distinguished from uh, historians like Abdul Rahman al-Rafai, who was an Egyptian historian um, writing in the um, early 20th century and whose views of the Ottoman period were conditioned by the nationalist context in which he was uh, conducting his research. 
So um, Abdurrahman al-Rafai is one of the people, perhaps his view was not as crude, but there's a group of scholars generally who, as um, people have already said um, in, in this uh, workshop, viewed the Ottoman period as one of decline and darkness, um, a period into which Egypt entered because it was conquered or occupied or colonized, and out of which it emerged triumphant you know, to independence after these uh, four or five centuries of Ottoman rule during which it had languished. So this idea of inhitat, mahlal, all of these uh, sort of bad and dark things. Um, and uh, Khalid Fahmi has discussed these historians in, in detail. He calls them the nationalist scholars. And in general, these scholars have faced considerable disparagement by their successors in the Western Academy. So for example, uh, uh, the Israeli historian Ehud Toledano, who, who wrote an article called Muhammad Ali or Mehmet Ali, so I was referring to that kind of distinction, and the title itself speaks volumes about the type of disagreement. You know, Is he Muhammad Ali? Are the Egyptians allowed to claim him as their own and as the founder of modern Egypt, as Dodwell said? Or is he Mehmet Ali and like a very Ottoman governor? And so let's find all of the things that make him Ottoman. What makes him Ottoman? Well, he didn't speak Arabic, so he can't be Egyptian. You know, you guys don't get him kind of thing. It's, re it's kind of at that level. Um, so the ramifications of this discussion are, are um, sometimes surprising. So Toledano describes the work of another one of the nationalist historians, Afaf Lutfi Sayyid, as follows. He writes, for Professor Marceau, the nation state is in and of itself a positive value, and the political independence of the nation state is a most virtuous and coveted end. Mehmet Ali is idolized, for without his efforts, it might have taken Egyptians much longer to be able to call Egypt their own. Okay, so you have these scholars who write about Muhammad Ali slash Mehmet Ali in the 19th century, and they sort of disagree over who he was, what he did, who can claim him, what his achievements were, and indeed, did he matter as a person at all? Um, so it's paradoxical that then there are other scholars like Jane Hathaway, who I mentioned earlier, who take the same epithet of nationalist and apply it not to the historians working on the 19th century, but to those of her colleagues and our colleagues who work on the preceding period and who relied on the sources that I mentioned that were produced in Egypt at the expense of those produced in Istanbul. So you have a group of um, historians who have worked on the court registers of Ottoman Cairo, but they don't refer to, or, or not overwhelmingly, they have not worked, for example, in the archives in Istanbul. They don't refer necessarily to firmans from the Sultan. They don't see Istanbul as being kind of the center of attention and um, things flowing from there to the province. So it's possible that the positionality of these scholars who worked on these Arabic language documents is one part of the problem for people like Hathaway, um, and in particular because it distinguishes them as signally, and I don't want to generalize, but I'm just saying what I've observed in my overview of the scholarship, it distinguishes them from Turkish and Israeli scholars who tend to take overwhelmingly the other stance, that you need the central administration's documents to be able to understand Egypt. You cannot study Egypt without studying the Turkish, the Ottoman Turkish documents. Um, so in this article that I mentioned, Rewriting 18th Century Egypt, Hathaway sums up the post-1960 shifts in historiography as the Ottoman period as follows, I'm quoting, a shift from exclusively political to social and economic history beginning in the 1960s and 1970s, and this was true again in large part due to André Raymond, who started to look at people beyond the ruling class, um, the increasing use of archival documents and the inclusion in the historical narrative of women and minority populations. And then, uh, end quote, she goes on to dismiss the nationalist assumption of a native Arab elite in at least implicit confrontation <coughs> with an imposed Turkish elite and the more recent commitment to the representation of authentic, the contemptuous little air quotes, um, Arab provincial sources and voices. So she doesn't give explicit examples of authors who might make such assumptions but she does condemn the tendency to rely exclusively on Arabic sources. I think I have the quote written down somewhere. Yes. So she says, reifying and in the process distorting the approaches of Peter Holt and Albert Horoni, she regards these as kind of the heroes in a way of um, uh, the historiography of Ottoman Egypt. 
um, to the Ottoman Arab provinces, a handful of scholars of the succeeding generation claim at least implicitly that Arabic sources are sufficient for the historiography of the Ottoman Arab lands and that scholarship drawn from such sources is somehow more authentic and faithful to the so-called indigenous Arab population of these lands than history drawn from Ottoman sources. Um, so, you know, there, there is kind of some toing and froing. There is also a, a, a quote from Nelly Hanna where she describes Jane Hathaway's work in kind of, you know, mirror reverse terms. She says she's talking, about, Hathaway wrote this book called The Tale of Two Factions about the Fiqareya and the Qasimeya in Egypt. So um, Nelly Hanna says, Hathaway attacks the Mamluk school of interpretation that considers Ottoman history as a continuation of Mamluk history. Even though factions had existed in the Mamluk Sultanate, the author argues the factions of Ottoman Egypt were closely linked to contemporary factions in other parts of the Ottoman state, their emergence being a function of the decentralization of the state. So you would think it's not necessarily either or, they have to be Mamluk or they have to be Ottoman, but these are kind of the terms of the debate. It's, it's been a very, um, a very exclusivist one. Okay, so we can think of this as a spat between individuals. You know, in a sense, I'm almost ashamed to speak about it because it's one of those things that, you know, we gossip about amongst ourselves, but it's not necessarily. But I think that it's really, really important to bring these things out, actually, because at the end of the day, they determine our, our positions in our field and the way that we produce, um, the, we produce scholarship as well. And it's a disagreement, this one in particular, that it has very significant methodological and even epistemological implications. So on one level, it's about this local notables paradigm. You know, is, that, is this a valid paradigm through which to analyze the provinces? Um, uh, the scope of that paradigm, how, to what extent can we use it? To what extent does it, um, does it help our analysis? And whether those who have worked on notables in the Arab provinces are faithful to Haroni's thesis, because in Hathaway's in indignation, one kind of detects this idea that you know, that's not what Haroni said, and you're not allowed to use his terms you know, to talk about something different. Um, and in particular, are people using the local notables paradigm to nationalist ends? Are they using it to say, for example, the Azm family in Damascus in the 18th century are kind of the reason for which Syria makes sense as a political entity after World War I? Because here we have you know, this kind of homegrown local ruling class that is capable of looking after the territorial interests and the interests of this particular local population. Okay, so are we using history to justify the desire for indigenous government and to suit the idea of a territorially consistent, politically durable nation state? And I'm sure that this comes up in teaching for all of us. Um, I, in particular, have a huge problem with students who say, for instance, oh, the pharaohs this and the pharaohs that, as if it had anything to do with them at all. But again, you know, one kind of needs to take a step away and, and examine um, all of those positions. So on another level, this disagreement is also about how to determine the identity or affiliations of the ruling class. So when Toledano talks about, for example, an Ottoman elite, what does he mean? He talks about this nebulous shared culture, you know, they speak uh, uh, Ottoman Turkish, they read Arabic poetry, they write to each other in Farsi, and for him this means that they are somehow part of this, you know, uh, elite Ottoman uh, culture. Um, Nelly Hanna, on the contrary, like if she's going to look at the, at the uh, affiliation, I suppose, of this ruling class, she'll say, well, the Ottoman governors only lasted, or the, the judges only came for a couple of years. The Sublime Port sent them, and then either the locals kicked them out or they were taken back. They were recalled and someone else was sent instead. But what she would focus on, rather, is the existence of an Arabic-speaking group of mediators who carried out, for example, the daily work of the courts, regardless of who occupied the citadel. On, are we done? Am I, should I stop? A few more minutes. A few more minutes? Okay. Um, I, I, will try and, I will try and condense get the rest the of what I have to say. Hmm? Get to the conclusion. I'll get to the conclusion. <laughs> I, will, I will do that. Um, okay, I, I, I will like, try and conclude on, on a point that means perhaps the most to me, which is the point of the evidence that we use and, um, and how we use it. So um, the, the question of access has been uh, extremely important in determining which historians used which sources. So for example, Gabriel Bayer, who wrote a very large and influential book called Egyptian Guilds in Modern Times, was not able to go to Egypt, was not able to access the Egyptian archives 
And what he used instead were published collections of 19th century government documents. So he makes many you know, wide-ranging conclu conclusions about the guilds that are then belied and contradicted by the kinds of documents one finds in the um, Sharia archives. And um, I, I do want to maybe kind of end on this anecdote and then a very short conclusion. Um, here is a picture that shows uh, Suraya Bey, the commander of the Turkish Camel Force in the Sinai. This is from a New, New Zealand World War I website. Um, he, during the advance to take the Suez Canal in 1916. Okay, why am I showing you this? Because it's Sinai and because here are some you know, um, Ottoman uh, troops. And uh, when I was doing my research at the National Archives for my dissertation, there was an Israeli scholar there and um, he had been allowed in, so it was a different time from Gabriel Bayer's time. By that point, the Israelis could <coughs> come to Egypt and they could go to the archives and everything. And he was doing his research on Bedouins in Sinai. And not once, there are maybe at the same thing at the Bashpakanlik archives, I don't know, I've never been there, but there are ladies in the reading room in the Egyptian National Archives, and they're kind of the interface between the researchers and the archives. So that Israeli scholar never once saw any document that had anything to do with his research topic at all. He saw lots of documents, they brought him lots of documents, but nothing that was relevant in any way. And one day I was chatting with one of the ladies of the reading room and she kind of rolled her eyes and she said, he's working on Sinai, can you believe it? I mean, Sinai, he's coming and he expects that we're going to show him documents. So this question of access is always, you know, very contingent on very small kinds of, you know, uh, decisions made by the gatekeepers, whether they're self-appointed or they're state-appointed, and these are the kinds of things um, ultimately that determine what we find. So I will conclude on this very, um, you know, sort of again, contingent, ambivalent <coughs> note, this idea of the allure of the archives, uh, we've referred to it several times here as archive fetishism. Um, I would refer to it as empiricism, um, and I, I do think that it's important to work on archives as a historian. Maybe it's not the most important thing or the only important thing, but I do think that if one wants to write, for example, about Ottoman Egypt, one needs to look at the court archives. Or one needs at least to understand what place the court archives occupy in the body of evidence or in the corpus that, that one might see. And yet, many historians have started to move away from that, especially the historians who have not had access, have started to move away to a kind of post-archive uh, stance or a post-archive position where they say, um, I will read you a quote by Liat Cosma. She's quoting Dominica Capra and she's kind of being disparaging about the archives. She says, this is the last thing that I'll say, I'm done. The significance of research is thus valorized according to the extent that it uncovers hitherto unknown and unpublished information. The archival historian is presumably the one who does real work, while the intellectual historian is but a relaxed parasite who does little more than reshuffling books. The archive is turned into a fetish when it becomes a literal substitute for the reality of the past, a stand-in for the past that brings the mystified experience of the thing itself. Um, again, you know, in rejecting the archives, just as in fetishizing them, um, probably a, a maybe more self-awareness is, at the end of the day, what we need. Thank you. Let me close this. I Should have his brother a in my yes. yes. I have the brother of Jacob Robinson. Ahmed. Oh, yeah. Yes. No way. I didn't know. I, I, I had never heard of him. <laughs> Do you want it? Yeah. OK, take it. Take it Some more there, frankly. <laughs> I don't know how to get out of this. There we go. No, not now. I can't refer to it. Okay. Yeah. I just want to... Dr. Razali. I found it. The questions that may arise... Ahlan wa sahlan. Do you have it? Thank you. Thank you for this fascinating... Ah, okay. Thank you for this... It made us think this uh, overview of the historiography. Uh, I liked very much your discussion about the sources and uh, this is something we could discuss about <coughs> the Ottoman uh, uh, province in Greek historiography as well. There was a 
and all the school working with the Greek sources, and then the Ottoman scale, uh, Ottoman historiography, using uh, uh, the Bashkar Gandhi, me being one of them. However, I think that for the historian, it might be more interesting and more a historian thing to do, not to quit, abandon, use sources at all, but to compare different sources. My uh, view on the subject is that the Ottoman sources from Bashbak Arlik, they are like, uh, they do speak about the provinces, but they have a more, uh, it, it, it's the view from Istanbul. And it's, in many cases, you need the local sources, I can speak for the Greek sources, to see from below, what is happening from below. Uh, in other cases, I showed you some Ottoman documents about Catholic bishops. There are Italian documents as well, telling that they are collaborating with the, uh, the Western powers. So my take in this is that for the historian, the most important thing and methodologically is not to rely upon a single series of sources like only Ottoman, only uh, uh, Arabic, only, uh, but I don't know what our colleagues think about that. Yeah, it's, uh, no, he just, he, yeah. It's just a comment, it's not a question. Yeah. I mean, there are very interesting pages at the beginning of Charlotte Manu's book on rediscovering Palestine, uh, arguing uh, on this topic that actually the way archives are, have been organized nowadays uh, do not necessarily, uh, the, the manner it's organized does not necessarily have to do with the, the contents and the organization of the, the document flux uh, at the time. So documents nowadays held at the Bashwakanuk, we consider them central because they are at the Bashwakanuk. Oh, okay. That is to say that they today depend on central states, so to speak, of the Republic of Turkey. But with regard to their, the, the, the fluxes of paper that they are the result of, many of these actually come directly from provincial or from local uh, production, let's say. Mm -hmm. Just to mention the, the petitions, for instance, which still remain something of a underexploited. Shikaret, Arzul Har, and so on and so forth. So uh, Duman is making the case for not confusing the contemporary organization of state archives and other archives, private or public, and the organization of paper production, uh, document production. So this basically comes back to the basic distinction between documents and archives, actually, which are, which are two, two, two choices of the paper organization. Yeah, They're just having a conversation. So it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> Even if you take the Muslim deterioration, which is absolutely <laughs> central, I mean, the demand, sometimes you don't get the story if you like know, so the, don't have access to local <laughs> sources. Nothing is worth that's it. That's what you do. <laughs> I don't know where someone else is. Go on, go on. Uh, it's expanding now. It does the usual structure of the document is that it summarizes an income report. So it's really what I just said. I mean, the central archives are the repository of provincial archives as well. So actually what I will say is I think it's important even when using the local archives to remember that they are not, and again, this is like a kind of no-brainer what I'm saying, but they're, they've often been used for quantitative histories that take the, them as representative of something. So using, for example, the number of, um, let's say, I don't know, um, sugar merchants in a given year, in a given neighborhood of Cairo who go to court as somehow representative of the total number. Um, and 
if we if we understand the the function of the courts and how they operate and who goes to them, like how many people, for example, have their probate inventory or their um, estate inventories recorded in court and for what reasons, then that changes our way of seeing them. So they're, they are a local source, but they're inscribed in this kind of bigger, I wouldn't call it necessarily an imperial framework, but a wider judicial framework, let's say. And if we don't understand that wider framework, then we risk you know, making very erroneous conclusions. Okay, any discussion will have to be on the subject, will have to occur during the supper time. <laughs> no. <laughs> now we we'll proceed to Malik I, Sharif. I don't, I, so Pascal, would you say that in fact well, it is an ideological uh, choice on the part of the Egyptian scholars like Halit Fahmi and Nelly Hanna not to use the sources in Istanbul and stick to the sources? Or it's just <laughs> they have enough and they're happy with that and so, because Nelly Hanna's scholarship, if you think of it, right? In, in fact, a lot of things that she complains about, maybe she will go and find material in Istanbul, but she never, she, she doesn't do it. So she just sticks to what she finds in the court registers and, and says, well, this is, what, this is what it is, this is what we, we have, and there's not much to do. Well, in fact, there is a lot more in Istanbul that you could just go and check. Uh, but the same for Khaled Fehmi, I would say. So, would you, would you no, actually, I don't think I don't think that you can you can compare them at all because Khalid has worked on Turkish documents yeah, as well. Yes. Khalid is one of the scholars who have worked on both. He and Alan Mikhail are the ones who mm -hmm. Alan Mikhail and Khalid Fahmi have worked on both the Egyptian um, 19th century documents, in particular, not the court documents, but 19th century, especially um, documents produced by the administration in Egypt in Arabic, mm -hmm. and the Ottoman Turkish documents. They've done both. So I don't think that you can put Khalid and Nelly in the same um, category at all. In terms of their source, I would. But you would not, that I would not be... He doesn't use the source in Istanbul, definitely not. No, absolutely, he does. Oh, not there, no. Uh, okay, Mikhail's yeah. a different story, so... We can settle the issue yeah. later, perhaps. But anyway, thank you very much. And then we proceed to Dr. Sharif swimming against the currents. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds more like a blues. Uh, <laughs> by the way, <clears throat> so as so as not to enter into the same discussion that started after uh, Pascal's talk, one thing I think the Bashbakan Lek Arshifi does not exist anymore. The Bashbakan the Bashbakan himself does not exist. Actually, it changed its name. So I mean, <laughs> it is still Bashbakan to us. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you. you you, you, you search it, you will not find it anyway. So uh, I think it is called Jumhur Bashkana nowadays. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll go to my uh, talk, which <clears throat> uh, is about, um, definitely not about archives, it is more, more or less about uh, a source that has to do with the, maybe the history or some part of the history of this university or how it developed in, in its early days, and later on how it continued in the private hands of uh, a Beiruti family that cherished it and typed it properly and kept it for a, for a while. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the, 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 the talk is based, as I'm calling it, on the unpublished memoirs of an Arab Ottoman officer uh, during World War I, is authored by Abdullah Dabbous, 1899-1963. Uh, and uh, his date of birth is not really clear. His daughter has told me he was born in 1900, but I think he's, in his memoirs, refers to 1899 or, uh, or his date, because in his memoirs he barely have very precise dates. One has to construct dates through spans of times. So <clears throat> this is about the memoirs of uh, Abdullah Dabbous, which is quite extensive in 147 pages. And <clears throat> I will try to go about the characterization of these memoirs. The memoirs covers the period 1916-1918 only. It is only about 29 months. Uh, inform, it, it also informs about the makeshift military training in Istanbul, a very important source that we don't have much actually information about it in other memoirs. Uh, other memoirs that were published in, in Arabic or 
in Turkish were actually training at the proper uh, uh, military academy, but this was mainly training during the war itself, and it was at makeshift military academy that was at, at four different places to the south of the Asiatic side of Istanbul, Fenerbahce, Erenköy, uh, Bustanje, and what was the fourth, actually? Mm. No, it was not, it is not, uh, Maltepe, not Kartal, Maltepe. So, the, the, these were, the, and the, 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 and these, and that academy was a makeshift one. It was in occupied villas in these beautiful summer, summer resorts for the rich Istanbulis. So here we have also plenty of, plenty of information. It tells us about the, the transformation of the urban nature of Istanbul during the World War I. So it is not only about the person, but also, also about the change in the urban factor due to the war. It also contains, and one of its, um, its importance, it contains minute details on the course of war in Transjordan from an Arab perspective, because we have so many, so many uh, from an Ottoman perspective, excuse me, uh, we have from British, uh, from the British side, we have from the, definitely, uh, we have the, the memoirs of uh, Al-Amir Abdullah, and we have other memoirs, or T.E. Lawrence, and so on, mo mostly from the British side. From the Ottoman side, we barely have information, and it, is, it fills an important gap. Uh, it also, I mean, the memoirs reflect on the shaky Arab-Turkish marriage in World War One. I. I mean, and this is how it was also uh, described. And it, it, the author himself claims to be informed, very much informed about the details about this kind of this marriage that was shaking, and claims to be objective. <clears throat> uh, also, another importance of this memoir it, that is that it gives a voice. Uh, to those who did, who did not find their place in the nationalist historiography of the post-war pe post period, actually. So it was, this memoir is written by a person who volunteered to go to war in the First World War. He was a Beiruti himself, an Arab-speaking, proud and proud of that, proud of his Arab heritage, but at the same time he considered himself Ottoman, and, um, or he saw himself as Ottoman. <clears throat> and uh, he also informs us about a large number of people like him. He names them, actually. We have so many different names uh, who joined in his same group, and none of them wrote anything about it, and we don't know anything about them, actually, other than through these memoirs. If you look through the, 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 the Arab memoirs, they are complete, they, they are different. They cover a different kind of uh, participation in the war, actually mainly either with the Ottomans and then they defected or against the Ottomans and so on. And if you look at the Turkish historiography, they, they are barely mentioned or the Turkish memoirs. So these people had no voice so far. <clears throat> and as it was mentioned by Selim Bey uh, yesterday, it also actually, this is also how the Boos perceives himself, it, it informs us about an emerging Ottoman middle, middle class, actually, and this is how the Boos sees himself, uh, that sees itself as a Bildungsburger to him. You know, this is, we are the educated middle class, and, and because of that, we have a claim. Uh, or or we, will, we will only succeed in an Ottoman meritocracy. Uh, or that's, at least that's what they aspired for. Now, uh, also it, it presents us uh, as the boost with a certain um, Weltanschauung, I, can't, I think it's, it is permissible in English, with their world view actually. How do they perceive the, the world actually? And this is how the boost perceived it as it should be an ethical word, it should be fair, there is no place for racism, and there is no place for difference. Culture is the thing that binds. Um, uh, humanity is important, and Islam. So, I mean, and the order, I think, is, 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 is in that way. Now, uh, if there is something which, is, which would warn or makes a historian a little bit sensitive about it, is that it adopts, actually, Topoi from early Republican Turkish nationalist history or myth-making, which is quite remarkable. I mean, especially when he's talking about, he was not at the Battle of Anafarta, but he retrospectively talks about the Battle of Anafarta, or, and also talks about... Mustafa Kemal, and uh, to him, Mustafa Kemal is, is, is one of the greatest heroes, which is 
definitely not the way the modern Turkish history is writing about Mustafa Kemal. And he was the commander of the whole Ottoman armies, as you know, like send, sending Liman von Sanders back to Istanbul and so on. I mean, you know, we have Aktai, uh, uh, Ayhan Aktai, who wrote actually on that, you know, the kind of criticizing this, this myth making of, uh, of Mustafa Kemal and Anafarta. So uh, this is present in, and it is good to be aware of that. Another thing that, that will come later on is that there, there are no clear dates in the, in the memoirs. So one has to cons construct the time span or the, 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 quite the exact time through mentions of some major events that he gives and they tell us about gates. For example, Eid al-Adha or the, the Qurban Bayram of 1918. And so on. So from that we can start. We know that the 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 Eid al-Adha in 1918 started. The first day was on the 16th of September, and the third day, the third day of the Eid was on the 17th, and the third day was on the 19th. And what it was the day of the last decisive battle in Palestine. <clears throat> so. If, we, if I may read here, and I think you can also read that, it's, it starts at the very merry beginning, actually. And he's talking about, you know, like they packed their, stu their, their stuff, they went to the port uh, with each, each one of them, or, or some of them with 10 gold liras. And we're talking here about gold coins and the, where, where, where the paper money was actually the, the, the dominant. Uh, each carrying 10 to 50 gold liras in his pocket, showing off about their outfit as if they were going out for dinner, you know. Uh, and, and on the 16th of April, they, they boarded the train to Damascus, and the, the man himself was so distracted by the dream of the glory of becoming an officer and so on, as you can see, getting his golden epaulets, his swords, and receiving salutes and whatnot. I mean, uh, if you, if you read this, it will remind you about the early mobilization in Europe during the First World War. I mean, you know, like the, the fiancés, gay women going with their men uh, to, to, to the train stations, you know, like, and everyone was happy that the, the boys will be back for Christmas. I mean, we're uh, now here, but the point is that this is not at the beginning of the war. We are here in April 1916, which means this was after August 1915 when the, the Jamal Pasha actually did hang people in Beirut itself. This is before the second wave that took place in Damascus on the 6th of May, but this was after Jamal Pasha. So, I mean, what, if you look at this, you are a little bit puzzled. I mean, you know, like, it, it sounds here, sounds like, wow, you know, like the man is going to fight for the, fa the, 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 fa the fatherland, for the Vatan, and so on, uh, and... Uh, it's so <clears throat> one should stop actually and pause and try to understand actually what brought him or what, what made him and people similar to him adopt or have such a similar, uh, similar attitude. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the legitimate question that begs itself actually, to, to, which should be asked, why did he take such a decision? Uh, or wh why the decision to join the army sounds the most natural thing, uh, the most na natural thing to do, actually, uh, as if they were going out for dinner, you know, like they were in, in, in nice suits and whatnot, and sweets were distributed. Well, this is Lewa, you know, they were distributing sweets at the, at the train station. Um, <clears throat> and how does it differ? I mean, it differs from other portrayals of Beirut from Beirut from that time, 1916, the hunger started. Uh, or at least uh, maybe not that severe in Beirut, but it was it was it was very evident. Uh, now, uh, here also maybe another <coughs> caution for a historian. I mean, we should we should try to see how we have to deal with the, how we have to deal with that. Um, <clears throat> I think I have some answers, and I I will try to have uh, to have. To try to, to answer these or to answer these questions, mainly talking about his mentor and about his early schooling years. His mentor is Abdul Jabbar Khairi, and his brother Abdul Sattar Khairi. Abdul Jabbar Khairi actually came from India after graduated from Ali Gara Islamic University, the University of Sir, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, came to Beirut and joined this university in 1904 earned his master degree from here in 1908 in physics. 
His brother, Abdul Abdul Sattar, graduated in 1909, earning a degree in chemistry. And both of them, immediately after graduating, started a, a, a school called Dar al Uloom. Uh, and the aspiration was actually to, to, to establish a university on the long run that competes with AUB. So it should have all faculties and it should be, it, and actually as the Boos says, it should also graduate missionaries. And he uses the word Mubashireen, but Muslim, Muslim missionaries. So he, do, he doesn't use the word Duat, but Mubashireen. So I mean, you know, exactly, he, he kind of, the, 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 the other side of the coin of the Syrian Protestant college at that time. Now, <clears throat> that kind of ideas were, 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 did fit very well in Enver Pasha's frame of mind at, at, at the time. I mean, and even, even the term al Jamia al Islamiyah has so many meanings. In Arabic, it means both the Muslim university and the Muslim unity. So even the, the, even the, Jabba, uh, the, the, the Khairi brothers called their Darul Uloom as the, the, the preparatory school for the Jamia al Islamiyah, which is the Muslim university, like the Muslim university in Aligara. But unlike Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, here was the university to serve the Ottomans, not the British. So here we can see in his early schoolings how he got under the influence of, uh, of the Khairi brothers. He also joined the Boy Scouts movement, which was mandatory in that school. And the Boy Scouts movement was also introduced in 1912 by Abdul Jabbar Khairi. And um, in 1914, they went in August 1914, actually late July, early August, they went to Istanbul on a visit to Istanbul. Here we have the booth at the age of 15 going to Istanbul, being received by Enver Pasha himself, a great, magnificent thing, visiting all important sites and museums and so on. A fact that left a very important imp um, uh, impression on the booth later on. And he remained as, as an enthusiast member of the Boy Scouts here. We see him in the, in the early 20s in the Boy Scout movement that changed it, its name, uh, becoming al Kashaf al-Muslim. Here in a cafe in Vienna, 1921, also as a Boy Scout um, <clears throat> And <clears throat> so the, the Boy Scout movement and its ideology. And please, one thing which is in the Mithakil, in the Mithakil Kashfi that was published in Beirut at that time, there were two items. The honor of the Boy Scout was to defend the Caliph. And the honor of the Boy Scout, I mean item two, was to defend the Al-Khalifa, Al-Watan, Wal-Walidayn. So it is the honor of the Boy Scout was to defend the, 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 the caliph, the homeland or the fatherland, and the, the parents, the parents of the, of the Boy Scout himself. And it says, you know, like defending not only physically, but even defending if someone criticized them. So, you know, like this was, it was a very, a very kind of strong propaganda, let's say, that really worked on, one would say, on the boost. There were other factors influencing his decision, and maybe I will come to that in, in the question time. So, should I finish? Should I conclude? It's possible. Fine. Uh, I, will, I will save you. I will save you. I, I can conclude and I can save you the war period by going through it quickly. This is the boost after graduating from the military, military academy proudly wearing his kalpak, actually. Uh, and it's, it's a bust. It is incomplete, but that's for the, most probably for the Shay, for the, you know, like the, his kimlik. Uh, that. These are here, we can see the areas where the booth actually was pre present in, uh, oh no, uh, not this one. Uh, I'm trying to get this one. Laser pointer, yeah. So actually he fought in Al Karak and then in Amman and then after that went fought in Al Ashuna Shamalia, which is here just facing the, the Alambis, Alambis forces. And he participated, kept, uh, stayed there until, or his unit stayed there until September, where they fought the last battle here at Tal al Nimrain. And um, here you can see the map after the Battle of Megiddo or Ma'arakat Nablus, as it is known in Arabic. 
and the collapse of the Ottoman uh, of the Ottoman front and the withdrawal. So here we have uh, the the the, <clears throat> the area Ashuna Shemaliya where they based they were based. Uh, uh, the front did not collapse. They were able to stop them for a while. So as you can see, the 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 the, 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 the cavalry, the British cavalry penetrated the Ottoman front to the north of them, and they caught up with them in Aramtha, where here Abdullah Dabbous met that bitter end. And in Aramtha, interestingly enough, he, he was able to save 200 of his colleagues, of his comrades. He was able to save them from what he considered as the evil of the Arabs. And he said, you know, he told his colleagues, you know, you don't know what kind of evil actually they have for you, how much they hate you. And, and what he did is that he, he stood at, in, his, in his memoirs in Arabic, he stood up and he addressed them as he says, Ayyuh al-Urban, which is, I mean, to use the word Urban, which is, is, is very derogatory actually, I don't know if he used it, I mean, simply means, oh you Bedouins, and it's very dismissive. So he was able to save them from the, from the, from the, from the local inhabitants of Aramtha, and then he surrendered to the British forces in late September 1918. Why in late September? Because we know that he surrendered after the Qurban Bayram, after Eid al-Adha of 1918, a week after it. So most probably, and he was not exact, so let's say if we count from the 17th and the week after it, 7th, so around the 24th of September. And he was taken all the way to Damascus uh, as, as a war prisoner. Now the irony of the Bus's fate is here is, is if you remember that bust photo of uh, the, here, we have a charcoal drawing of the Bus, and this was commissioned in Beirut by here, it is not very legible. It was commissioned in Beirut uh, the one who did it was Mustafa Farouk, one of the most famous painters in Beirut at that time. And the irony is that he commissioned it the first week of September 1918, so until three weeks before the end of the war. This is how the Bus wanted to be remembered. I mean, it, it is rather, so that, that one was not enough. It didn't show his kind of officer's status. So he wanted the epaulets more clear. He wanted the sword. He wanted the gold trappings and so on. So here we see them. In, 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 in that, and I mean, I asked also a, an art historian colleague of mine to try to under, to identify the background, and they said that, you know, behind him, then we have a flight of stairs that they look more like marble flight of stairs, cypress trees that are uh, quite typical, actually, of, the, of, of these nice summer resorts in, in the area where he was in Istanbul, you know, like so this kind of broad marble flight of stairs and so on. So it is more or less rem reminiscent of his time in, in, in Istanbul. Uh, now, as a concluding remark, I mean, Abdullah Dabbous will be able actually to address the readers in English again. I mean, like he addressed the, the, the British who captured him. And this is this year. His memoirs are, 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 will be published this year in, this year in English. Uh, thank you. Questions? Ms. Bago. No, no, no. <laughs> no, this is not. Where, where are the... Where, where, where are they kept? Who, who owns them? Are they? Uh, they are, are they available? Are, do they constitute an archive of sorts? Uh, no. The, the, I, I tried to convince, actually, I tried to convince the, the family to donate them to the AUB library. And, and if not, actually, I was, at that time, there were talks about Beit Beirut. I mean, and simply saying, you know, like, your grandfather was very proud of being a Beiruti, so actually you should donate them. Because Beit Beirut is going was the idea was that it should be a documentation center as well, and they have about the history of the Be of Beirut, so they should. They didn't. They are still very kind of cautious about them. I mean, they said their grandfather did not want to publish them, so they prefer not to. And uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, like it was his daughter who to type them, uh, and um, but the original. Copies are still kept at the family. 
Hi. As I told you before, I just wanted to share it with our friends. Uh, his great granddaughter was my student at NAU. And that's how I came to know about. She yeah. brought me the whole collection. I didn't realize we were working on it. I was very happy to find that out. Yeah, they'll come out soon, actually. Yeah, in, in, in English. And, uh, so in I, English. Um, and um, so I used some of this. She yeah. translated some of the sections for me. And maybe uh, you didn't say it because of the time constraints, but perhaps you could share with us his interview with General Clayton, the, the New Zealander, whom we actually surrendered to. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, it is um, it is not here, by the way, but it is that is a, that's an interesting episode, actually, and it tells a great deal about the memoirs. When 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 Abdullah Dabbu surrendered, and actually all his colleagues, even superior officers, told told him, "You are our commander now." After saving well, they them. couldn't tell him anything. They were all wounded. No, died. no, no. Not all. Not all. Actually, two hundred of them were not wounded. No, I mean his officers. Yeah, no, the, but uh, the, 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 actually he says it was Captain Omar Bey who told me I should command now. So he was, anyhow, when he met the, in the, New, Zeal, the, New, Zealand, uh, the New Zealander commander of the cavalry, actually, he told them, you are, you are an Arab, you speak English, you must have been forced into, to, to join the, the Ottoman army. Why? It is now your chance. It is your opportunity. You should change sides now, and you should go to the to the to the Arab revolt. You should go to the side of Faisal, because they need people like you, those who could, could speak Arabic, English, and th he was a machine gun officer, so you, they knew really badly need. And he said, "I can't. I mean, I did my duty. I fought with the Ottoman army. I cannot fight against it." And that was my duty. I was not forced. I mean, the Ottomans are Arabs, Turks, Kurds, um, uh, Albanians, and so on. He didn't mention Armenians, by the way, and that is also part of the, the Turkish nationalist historiography in it, and so on. And uh, and he refused. I mean, he didn't change side. I mean, he remained as as a proud Arab, but not on the side of the Arab revolt. I hope I un answered your uh, your. No, I just yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Half an hour is yours as well. All right. That's great. Okay, so my first go in this presentation. Oh, closer. Thank you. My first go in this presentation is to draw attention to a well documented and historically significant phenomenon which has so far received, unfortunately, um, insufficient scholarly attention. Of course, this is a very self-serving uh, statement because I happen to work on this. Um, namely, the concerted effort of mid to late 19th century monarchs in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere to bypass long-standing local intermediaries and appeal directly to the hearts and minds of their subjects throughout the far-flung imperial domains in ways and on a scale uh, never seen before. Today I will provide a brief overview of my theoretical framework shaped by empirical findings centered on the late Ottoman Empire and with occasional recourse to the late Russian imperial experiences as well and I will explain exactly why a little bit later. My argument is based on the following premises. Um, in the spirit of Einstein's theory of relativity, I will give you both general and special definitions of modernity and nationalism today. Unfortunately, I have no pictures, so you'll have to feast your eyes on very dry and technical definitions. But I think uh, my economic background uh, is an excuse here I can use. So first, modernity is a complex, historically salient phenomenon, which consists of a bundle of parallel economic, political, and sociocultural processes. Second, nationalism and modernity are intimately related in very recent phenomena. In terms of setting a mass scale a socio-cultural precedent which permanently altered the notion of public space slash sphere, and I'll get back to that a little bit later, that concept, and the discourse and practices of power, both nationalism and modernity in Europe can, in my view, be traced no earlier than the French Revolution. And of course, I'm not very original in this, in believing this. Within the Romanov realm, uh, I would argue these phenomena had an initial impact during and after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, in the reign of Alexander I, and a second, much more momentous impact following 
the ill-fated 1825 Decembrist revolt against the accession of Nicholas I, who reigned from 1825 to 1855, in favor of constitutional monarchy. Within the Ottoman realm, these phenomena were announced in a most lasting, implication-rich manner by the revolt which later became known as the Greek Revolution and the abolition of the Janissary Corps in its midst on June 16, 1826, during the reign of Mahmoud II, uh, 1808 to 1839. The Greek Revolution set a precedent for the carving out <coughs> of Ottoman territory with vital Western, especially British support, uh, coming back to the British again, touching on them, based on a putative national principle, leading to the establishment of the modern state of Greece in 1832. So in short, we have two neighboring autocratic Eurasian land empires uh, and every word matters a great deal, experiencing simultaneous periods of profound vulnerability uh, at the beginning of the second quarter of the 19th century. The traumatic events of December 1825 and June 1826, respectively, called for urgent reforms in all spheres of public life, beginning with the public image and popular symbolic functions of the monarch. Consequently, in the second quarter of the 19th century, both Nicholas I and Mahmoud II implemented policies of what I call increased ruler visibility. I define ruler visibility as a combination of direct and indirect components. The former include the ruler's physical presence at public ceremonies and the degree of his or her personal exposure to the public gaze. And I'll drop the her because it's all, always a his in the empires in the period that I'm looking at. Not so for the 18th century Russian Empire, obviously. Um, the latter so the indirect components consist of a set of symbolic markers of the ruler, such as his monogram on the one hand, and the architectural monuments, such as Figaro statues in the Russian case, or fountains in the Ottoman case. Churches slash mosques, palaces and tombs constructed or restored by him on the other. In the absence of a consistent, genuine, and credible effort on the part of the ruler in the pre-modern period to reach out past elite circles in the capital, uh, it circles and the confines of the capital, and due to the lack of uh, a periodical press and mass culture to popularize his good works, both types of ruler visibility were quite limited in the pre-modern period. Now, modern ruler visibility uh, is a composite concept combining projected traits of personal character with short-term and long-term imperatives of policy, both domestically and abroad. It incorporates not only physical and symbolic aspects, a monarch's more active participation in public events and ceremonies, and the proliferation of his markers throughout the imperial domains, but also the more frequent occurrence of references to and discussions of his person or persona in the press. Now, the reason I keep bringing up the Russian Empire and Nicholas I in particular is that this emperor's visibility policies directly affected the composition and implementation of groundbreaking Ottoman policies of the same kind centered on Mahmoud II. And this is a connection I haven't yet seen made anywhere uh, yet. Uh, the first stage of trans what I call trans-imperial impact uh, took place during the 1828-29 Russo-Ottoman War, with the Russian troops celebrating lavishly not only Nikolai's own occasions, or even incredibly the deceased Alexander's name day, but also their living brother, Grand Duke Michael's name day on the European and or Asian fronts. The second stage uh, took place in 1833 when Russian troops spent a four month stint on the Bosphorus per Mahmoud II's request to provide security from Egypt's Ibrahim Pasha. Uh, and, it, and, it, and this period took things to an entirely different level in terms of spectacle size, active sultanic involvement, and ceremonial legacy ultimately. Uh, until the 1830s, the Ottoman Sultan was a very distant and rather vague figure in the minds of the vast majority of his subjects throughout the imperial realm. Since he played no role whatsoever in their day-to-day -day lives, his image was almost non-existent. Since over the course of the previous century and a half, the ruler had rarely left the palace complex and had even less frequently ventured beyond the capital, most people were not only thoroughly unaccustomed to being in his presence, but not even aware of his looks. Prior to the beginnings of modern ruler visibility, the nucleus of the power structure in each provincial center 
represented by a governor or a well-connected local magnate and his household and followers radiated influence out to its regional periphery in emulation of the imperial household itself, the ultimate paragon. This local arrangement was the empire's face in the provinces, I would argue, um, the one and only empire locals knew, in a way, or most locals knew. Therefore, this was the world they identified with. People saw themselves in loose confessional, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, etc., and strict professional, artisan, peasant, merchant, and so on terms. They were regionally defined in the case of sedentary populations, uh, the ones that I work with. Nomads are, of course, much more messy. Um, a village and its surroundings up to but rarely farther than the nearest town. After all, this was the zone of habitation and movement for most people. In this, the natural terrain, a mountain, a valley, a river, often played a key role. The terrain set the pace of everyday life in a number of ways, via climate, types of livelihood available, and hence types of clothing, tools, customs, regional dialects, and other specificities. What people decidedly did not identify with were ethno-national groups. In fact, I would go further and say that such groups did not exist at the time. They simply had no basis in the lived reality of people. Moreover, being born and raised in a town or village in its vicinity created horizontal bonds which frequently cut across religious and professional ties. This was one's fatherland, Watan, Vatan, uh, Otechistvo in Bulgarian, in physical, linguistic, cultural, and emotional terms. And this lasted quite late. Uh, in a way, it lasts until today. The first major vehicles of modern ruler visibility in the Ottoman case were the sultanic tours of the imperial domains, introduced by Mahmoud II after <coughs> a century or so of prevailing sultanic seclusion that I mentioned already. Over a period of seven years, from 1830 to 1837, Mahmoud II made no fewer than five imperial tours of the provinces. As Genghis Karla insightfully points out, each trip went farther away from the capital, and the majority of them were clearly designed with the empire's non-Muslim population in mind. Despite the official purpose of the trips, to examine the living conditions of the subjects and provide charity to the poor, Karla convincingly argues that Mahmoud II's real purpose was, quote, to be seen rather than to see his subjects, unquote. This then was the beginning of a long and circuitous trend of popular validation of the monarch in each of these two empires, a theme which was not there earlier in any shape or form, the power of the sovereign stemming from sources other than popular acclaim, or you know, popular sovereignty, the beginnings of, of popular sovereignty principle. It would naturally call for more visibility of future rulers, as well as the gradual assumption of increased duties and responsibilities with respect to their subjects. Now, the main vehicles of modern ruler visibility uh, were the systematic and far-reaching annual secular public ruler celebrations, in the Ottoman case, the royal birthday and the accession day, which had widely felt impact at least until the Young Turk Revolution of 1908. These festivities commenced by order of Mahmoud II in the capital, the provinces, and abroad in 1836, a fact which remains almost completely unknown and has until today received hardly any scholarly attention. Reinforced by technological improvements and the advancement of print media, these proliferating and escalating ceremonial events ushered in a new era of ruler visibility, creating a modern public space slash sphere and forging credible, direct, vertical ties of subject loyalty, irrespective of language, location, creed, <coughs> or class. Being a stickler for definitions, here is the latest one, public space sphere. Um, a, a very nutty one. Uh, yeah, it's... It's messy, I, I will read it slowly. This dual concept is a gradually evolving public space slash sphere, which starts from a zero point, if we want to generalize about it, that is the ruler has no presence physically and uh, a minimal presence symbolically. Its expansion is dictated in the first place by the sultanic tours of the countryside, a major if sporadic effect helping jump, jumpstart the phenomenon, and then much more significantly and lastingly by the annual ruler celebrations. Thus, it commences quite literally as a public space, uh, and one can read about this in the documents, where the people welcome the ruler or gather and organize in groups to celebrate him annually at the town or village square or a specially designated area outside. By way of recurrence, a growing scale and a rising ritual complexity, over time, these celebrations gradually tip the balance towards a public sphere, close, closer to Habermasian terms, of wider boundaries 
of the desirable slash permissible or acceptable symbolic interaction between the ruler and the ruled, which ultimately set the stage for a modern type of belonging. With Mahmoud II's death, trying to move through some sultans here, uh, ruler celebrations experienced a temporary setback, partly due to the solar versus lunar calendar issue, but did not go away. In fact, Abdul Majid's 1846 tour of Rumelia whipped up extraordinary enthusiasm among the Bulgars, for example, as did his 1859 visit to Selanik among the Jews. In my recently published book, I undertook a study of the communal trajectory, among other things, uh, study of the communal tra trajectory of the Bulgars of Rumelia vis-a-vis -vis Sultan and dynasty. I examined the set of cultural stimuli originating from the Ottoman monarchs, from Mahmoud II to Abdulaziz, to which ordinary Bulgars were exposed, leading over time to cycles of symbolic interaction between the ruler and ruled. This community was at one point considered exceptionally loyal to its ruler, just like the Greeks had been before, and a pillar of the imperial order before veering off and going its own way towards ethno-nationalism, measured by claims for and actions towards political independence. Uh, therefore, it seems that the new imperial policies of ruler celebration, along with the discourses and practices spun around them, unlocked a complex process of extension of the long-standing localized micro forms of belonging, which I defined earlier, uh, and their linkage to the center for a new imperial macro form of belonging uh, at the popular level. In my view, this shift signaled the advent of modernity as a mindset, and this is my special definition of modernity, the smaller. Um, now, if we take the Bulgars as an example of a community in the making, then we can clearly see not only how it built itself off of celebrations of the ruler, but how it started becoming more visible in the capital as well. By way of the nascent Bulgar periodical press, printing provincial ceremonial reports and letters, but there were other ways as well. And here I'm moving to the second part of the uh, presentation, the visibility of the provinces. For the accession of Sultan Abdulaziz in 1861, I uh, will give you here a very colorful example. The Bulgars took advantage of their church's favorable location in Balad. So for the day of Abdulaziz's <coughs> sword guarding, Kalaj Kushanma, they prepared a special ceremony to honor the Sultan during his passage to Ayyub, because he was going to pass by the church right next uh, along the Halic. So for the day of, uh, yeah, so the, the church wardens uh, erected two columns draped in white cloth connected by an iron semicircle on top, decorated with flowers and greenery. These columns supported three marble slates with Ottoman writing in gold, which read, May our Sultan Abdulaziz live for a thousand years. Sultan Abdulaziz Efendimiz Yasha Yasha bin Leresha. In the shadow of this decorative arch stood the Bulgar clergy in their Sunday's best. Lined up on both sides were school children dressed in white along with acolytes. The ceremonial roar of the cannons announcing Abdulaziz's departure for Ayyub, drew the attention of the numerous crowds gathered on the church grounds. Five minutes later, the Sultan was greeted by the Navy personnel from the Imperial Fleet Station on the Golden Horn. When the Sultan approached the Bulgar church, the acolytes and the students commenced a song specially composed for the occasion, accompanied by the crowd's loud cheering. While passing, the Sultan's attention was drawn by this popular ceremony, Narodna Ceremonia, and he returned the greeting by ordering his 13 rowers to hoist their oars up in the air. The Bulgar clergy bowed and the people cried out in the midst of the imperial batteries continuing thunderous salvos. A very climatic moment, very beautiful. The accession of Abdulaziz brought about the final regulation of Julus, solar, and Veladet, lunar festivities across the empire. Reports of provincial celebrations of the event then of its anniversaries started pouring in from the provinces in countless numbers, still waiting in, at the archives in Istanbul to be analyzed by historians. Technological advances leading to higher connectedness surely helped this process along. On official days, the Sultan would receive an increasing number of telegrams from the provinces, so much so that occasionally the issue of who should pay for them would be raised. By the time of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and the shift towards what I call ruler invisibility, beginning in 1880, other channels for provincial visibility in the capital would appear, uh, with portraits being, and by invisibility I mean direct invisibility, not being seen himself, not, not, no portraits, and I'll talk about that in a second, but indirect visibility still goes on. Uh, 
So other channels of provincial visibility in the capital would appear, with portraits being proscribed to Muslim celebrants, though not to Christian ones, uh, and ceremonial expectations growing over time, ever more elaborate fountains would be designed, photographed and published on the pages of journals such as Serveti Finun and Malumat. The same goes for triumphal arches, clock towers, Hijaz train stations, hospitals, orphanages, local government buildings, and so on, especially in connection to birthday and accession anniversaries, the 25th being the grandest of them all. I have called this practice cross-dating, that is, the act of combining one ceremonial occasion, such as the inauguration of a building, with another, such as the royal accession anniversary, for example, on the same day for an accumulated effect on the public mind. This was a major strategy for autocratic legitimation in many late empires. The Ottomans are, can provide just one set of examples. Another such strategy was what I have called the myth of naming. Many of these monuments and markers would be called Hamidiye, uh, or in Russia, Alexandrovsky, Nikolaevsky, and so on. In conclusion, studying mass-scale public ruler festivities and their spillover effects allows a historian to weave a more integrated account of 19th century cultural history, not only because these ceremonial events engaged all social strata, but also because they drew all religio-linguistic communities within a given empire. Thus, they acted as a major equalizing factor, <coughs> both socially and spatially. Uh, and this is about, again, the equality of provinces versus center, becoming more relevant to the provinces and, and more equal to the center in a way. Um, in terms of loyalty, because of the loyalty thing. Uh, so, uh, both socially and spatially, due to the essential sameness of declared individual imperial feeling, uh, which is then the same for nationalism. All is equal, everyone is equal vis-a-vis -vis the nation. Um, so, in a shameless bit of self-promotion. Uh, for more on these processes, with a focus on the Ottoman Empire and substantial coverage of the Russian Empire, you may wish to consult my newly released book, um, and thank you very much. This was Mahmoud II, 1837, painting. Questions? I can only describe it in such terms. And of course, uh, in the book, I have also a section about ruler visibility before the, the modern period. And of course, it's something which goes in ebbs and flows. You know, their highs, depending on the century you're talking about and the rulers 
personal preferences. And I, I've gotten the challenge of the Roman Empire many times, which is the cult of the emperor, which is very similar to what goes on in the 19th century. Same thing goes for Elizabeth I of, of England. She went through the country and uh, paraded herself in, in great ways. So there are very many similarities. I mean, they didn't invent everything about ruler visibility in the 19th century. But there are qualitative and, and mo mostly quantitative, but also qualitative differences, I think, between the 19th century and earlier centuries, which have to do with technology, the ability to enforce this visibility, to, uh, and, and also with, with the mass culture, the mass press. Every day, I mean, w as you go towards the middle of the 19th century and, and later, on a daily basis, descriptions, ceremonial descriptions appear on the pages of the, of the press, especially towards the end. Where people know where Abdul Hamid is this day, what is he doing, or Abdul Aziz, and you know, meeting with whom. And so this sort of scrutiny could, ne could never exist before. Uh, nor did the need of rulers to do this, because they didn't have to appeal to average Joe somewhere out there. Uh, the principles, they, they played to a local small coterie. I mean, I don't want to overly generalize, but of course there were local uh, notables and, and things. Uh, so I think you're right. I mean, not everything is, is started in the 19th century, but I think there are still significant differences for us to talk about. I agree. And uh, another uh, question. It is absolutely not true that there were no uh, uh, ethical identities in early centuries. You have Kurdish, you have tribal identity. You, you have uh, also uh, early traces of ethical identity. Serbian are now Bulgar in 16th century, 17th century. They, I, they recognize them. I, I have to disagree. The, uh, the, the papal envoy in uh, 17th century passed and visited Serbian patriarch uh, uh, in the middle uh, and says, oh, he has some books uh, about Serbian history and he's preserving them, not giving us to, to see what, what is written about these people. You know, they, they have the, con uh, the conscious of belonging to some ethical corpus. It was not defined, of course, in the modern theory of 19th century, but uh, there, uh, there existed something. There is, this is something, of course. Uh, my uh, approach is instrumentalist. If we want to know what ethnicity is today, okay. we need to... If you choose the approach, then no, okay. No, 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 I, because I, bec I think the term ethnic makes sense. Uh, only in connection to a state. So is it related to a nation state of some sort? Then, it, then, then to me it's ethnic. Otherwise there are other words. We can use other so words, you know, cultural, local. I like religious linguistic, for example. Uh, if, you, if you want to know, because we use it today, if you want to know what, what it is today, we need to qualify it, define it uh, carefully, I think. Because otherwise, it can become anything. If you look back, you can, you can call anything ethnic. That's my problem with the ethnic term being applied to the pre-modern period. Anything can be ethnic. Who is carrying the microphone? <laughs> I have a trouble. Another thing that, um, in, in uh, defense of Dalek, uh, another thing that is actually new to these uh, ceremonies is that they're actually in dialogue. I mean, Abdul Hamid takes his model for his 25th Jubilee. 25 is not a particularly auspicious number in Islam. Okay, but it is if you're looking at Queen Victoria's 25th Jubilee. So there's also this, uh, there's also this uh, dialogue uh, between the imperial uh, sort of uh, image makers, if you like. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, uh, if I can just make a quick uh, comment. Uh, there's so many descriptions of 25th uh, cere uh, anniversary ceremonies in the Bashbak and Luck. He, he got all the reports from all across Europe, the 25th anniversary of the wedding of the Habsburg Emperor, 25th this, 25th that, and then he designed his own. Uh, just a uh, short uh, answer. <coughs> I just downloaded your PDF version of your book. I'm mean, very uh, <laughs> I'm going to read the book because I, mean, I found that all the information <coughs> important. While I was a student of Silicon in the early 1990s, I was reading a lot uh, on this display. I mean, I've been using different uh, ter ter terminology while uh, talking, thinking about the similar issues. Performances of power, display, for example. And in my dissertation, I wrote, and I also published a history articles in English and many in Turkish, uh, as how Hamid uh, himself used charity, philanthropy, imperial gift as technologies or instruments of making invisible. So 
And also, I mean, this public sphere, uh, civil society, those, those type of conceptual issues, and I published a lot of religions, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, which uh, deals a lot on how in the Hamid in the late 19th century, under an autocratic regime like Hamid himself, how he used this expanding public sphere, how he himself promoted this expansion of the public sphere in order to make his presence visible <coughs> to the wider public. So, I was trying to uh, turn this conception, because public civil society means uh, participation, democracy, or at least uh, 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 the connotation of the term is in historiography. Yeah. So I'm trying to change the meaning of the term in order to make it expand it. I mean, for example, Hamid is himself expanding the public sphere by means of uh, performances in order to legitimize his uh, power. So I'm using uh, a different, different terminology, for example, legitimacy, which you mentioned in your presentation. And uh, so what, what I'm saying is, I mean, for example, in early 1990s, Richard Fortman, I'm sure yeah, you're familiar, of he published two uh, uh, volumes, at least 600 pages, and he used the conception of scenarios of power, yeah. which is also an interesting and useful terminology. Absolutely. And also Fujitani, in a, yeah. again, in the late 90, second part of 1990s, or maybe earlier, he published on uh, Japan, and also later he published another article which is very interesting, electronic pagination, something like new technologies of making visible the power in contemporary Japan. And another, there are lots of useful uh, articles and books, and also books on uh, Iran. So you ask I'm a question, it, please? Uh, this you have a question? question. Comment. Uh, comment. Okay. Yeah. Please. So I can start. <laughs> Okay. Thank, thank you. 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 You made in the theoretical part of your presentation yeah, like a clear yeah. distinction between traditional and modern. Whereas it might be interest, more interesting to see, of course, it's different. These are modern things, but there is a transition. There are older forms of visibility, uh, re, uh, and of course. Uh, New things, no doubt about that. But it might be mm -hmm. eh? there, there, there is re reading uh, the past. Now about and the other thing we might also in the same argument discuss about what you said, ethnic yes. by the way it's an anthropological terms, term, ethnic boundaries and so maybe not directly connected with uh, the state, but in defense again of what Sasha said, I was reading Evia Celebi uh, in the Balkans. Uh, yes. I, 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 have, I always had the idea that the word room meant all the Orthodox uh, no, no, population. Clear. But if you read Evia Celebi, room are the Greeks, the I'm Greek Orthodox, there are Bulgar, yeah. Serb, and almost everybody. Uh, now, we have to deal with, with it. Yeah? Apart, they are not the modern uh, nations, no doubt about that. But we have somehow to deal about with yeah, these but, but uh, the, definitions from uh, definitions by the Ottoman, from an Ottoman elite figure like Yogi. Yes, this calls for an answer. Yeah, the, the point <coughs> the point is well taken. Uh, I'm just saying uh, because what would those people that Evliya designated as Bulgar? How would they have described themselves? This is what I want to know. And because the local uh, descriptors were so powerful, even into the 19th century, I chose to go with them because my main, my target sort of subject is really the average person out there in the provinces. Like, what would they think? How would they identify? Because ultimately, nationalism is about the numbers. You need to get the masses involved. And of course, the word Bulgar circulates around, but, but how much? Who called themselves Bulgar? Uh, of course, the word Bulgaria appears on maps from the Middle Ages and all the way in Western maps. But again, who is doing the calling? And, and, and what would, how would the locals have called themselves? Because in the 19th century, the locals called themselves locally. 
And this is how trade networks are created in, in Istanbul. They meet each other and they say immediately, I'm from this town and, and you know, certain towns can control certain businesses even. Uh, so this is a, the salient marker in the 19th century. You know, maybe it's, uh, yeah, I mean, short memory, but uh, in general, I think by allowing the ethnicity marker all the way back to the Middle Ages or even to antiquity, it's not helping us understand things better. That's all I'm saying. You promised towards the end to, to speak about the invisibility of the Sultan. I mean, oh, sure. Uh, well, in, in, in 18... I'm curious as how visibility leads to invisibility. Well, I mean, you have the... Uh, it's, it's a long story, but in 1880, the and there's a document that Etem al has talked about, and I talk about it a little bit, uh, gives a, a penalty to the court photographers, the Abdullah brothers, for making uh, portraits of himself without permission. And he says, in the future, let, let's destroy all of these. And in the future, whenever you want to make a portrait of, of me, you need to uh, get the permission from me. So because he wants to portray himself as caliph, now the majority is <coughs> arguably Muslim of the empire. Uh, and he has consolidated his power. He uh, allows uh, Padishah Hamchok Yasha, along with the Sultan banners, to be shown so calligraphic renditions, but not physical portraits, and so he becomes invisible, and he's also invisible within Istanbul, in the Yildiz uh, Palace complex, okay, partly for security, but not only, uh, but he's visible, so it's a channel visibility, invisibility to the domestic Muslim audience, but uh, visibility to Western rulers coming to visit, such as the Kaiser in 1889 and 1898, um, so, but again, uh, behind closed doors, he's acting as a Western ruler with Westerners, behind closed doors, but outside the Kaiser goes alone and sends a telegram to the Sultan. It's very uh, choreographic. Thank you very much. My well, pleasure. It's time to get to Dublin, as it were. <laughs> uh, That's tomorrow. <laughs> The last speaker today is Dr. Tyler Brand, and he's speaking about the role of low-level agents in narratives of Ottoman oppression. Thank you. Um, as the audience seems to have gotten a bit feisty, I'd like to start off with actually an apology. Um, so I was a rather late addition to the program, and so this is less of a paper than a sort of series of thoughts that I've been kicking around. Um, and I'm dealing actually less with issues um, of, say, positivistic history and you know, archive, um, and more of issues of you know, public representations, memory, and sort of kind of history is how it's remembered in certain sort of um, you know, narratives. Um, and this is probably something that's you no. Know, perhaps you know, a doubly negative sort of thing. Um, if you consider the fact that the historiography of World War I, um, even going back to the first sort of um, you know, kind of academic attempts at it, Nicholas Ajay, um, you know, Schildscher, um, more recently with uh, Millie Ten uh, Tenneli and myself, um, we spent most of the time trying to go through and you know, clear up a lot of these misconceptions that have been in the popular record about you know, issues of things like, say, you know, Ottoman oppression. Um, generally, the consensus nowadays is, you know, the Ottomans did screw up some things, um, but the narrative um, that um, Salim had brought up about sort of deliberate eradication of the population of Mount Lebanon um, perhaps wasn't exactly, you know, an intended sort of outcome, uh, particularly if you'd be in looking at sort of, you know, attempts to kind of deal with the problem. Um, certainly they contributed, but this was more through... Um, mismanagement, ineptitude, corruption, and things like this. Um, so, yeah, they screwed up, but it wasn't like, you know, quite that bad. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, in addition to this, um, I'm resorting again to certain things that are a bit more problematic than archival sources, always problematic in their own sorts of way. Um, as Malik had indicated, um, dealing with memoir, you're dealing with a very sort of particular perspective. In many cases, these perspectives you know, can try to rep represent themselves as authoritative, that they represent the common opinion or they know something um, that, you know, by virtue of their existing in a specific space and time, um, it gives them some sort of reason for speaking on this um, in a particular way. Um, this is kind of questionable. I'm, I'm existing in a space and time where Donald Trump allegedly is conspired with the Russians to sell the Americans off to you know, Putin. Um, whatever that may be. Um, yes, I lived during that period, I hear lots of things about it, um, but does that give me a real authoritative understanding about what actually happened? Um, not exactly. Um, in certain cases, as in Malik's uh, own particular um, source, um, the sources can also portray themselves as in, you know, kind of 
conveying a certain sort of attitude that would be kind of contrary to um, the standard opinion. Um, in many cases, these sort of um, you know, attempts to portray certain things um, are also very personal. Um, one of the issues in memoir, um, and actually our um, guest Amelie knows about this, is that if you have any sort of bone to pick or axe to grind, oftentimes a memoir is a really great way to do it. Um, so if you're looking at, I guess, the history of World War I and the sort of understanding about the sort of Ottoman role in the provinces, um, we have to kind of consider the role of memoir of these popular narratives and the role of stories in general. So what is the value of a story as we're trying to understand these sorts of things. Um, as many of these are being you know, narratives conveyed through memoir, they have to be somewhat simplistic. Um, oftentimes they have to cons kind of cons um, conform to a, a general understanding about certain characters, um, certain events, and certain spaces and time. Um, the setting has to be recognizable in order for the conclusions then to carry any sort of value. Um, so to a certain extent, you didn't necessarily have to have, I guess, a sort of truth value that is actually correct um, for these stories to convey value, um, they generally do have to be believable and they do have to, for the most part, fit within a certain, I guess, realm of storytelling that already exists, um, you know, sort of genre of the period. So looking at the question of Ottoman oppression and this sort of Lebanese provincial history and the sort of popular narrative of the war, um, you know, one question that I suppose to ask is, you know, did this actually take place? Um, in memoir, um, this, this sort of representation is this being a, a sort of kind of almost inevitable outcome of the war, um, as most of these have been written retrospectively. Um, they're writing from the perspective of a, an event that's already taking place in an era wherein many people had already formed their conclusions about the Ottoman administration during the period of the war. Um, and then the sort of um, narrative of nationalism that came afterwards um, that, for the most part, began to define the Ottomans in really sort of negative, pejorative terms. Um, so from what we can tell, you know, this is certainly a um, product of post-war recollections of the wartime period, uh, memoirs in particular. Um, but reading some of the sort of contemporary, uh, contemporary reflections on the war, you know, memoirs, letters, and things like that, uh, not memoirs, sorry, diaries, memories, and things that were actually written during the war, there's also some indication that, of course, you did have this sort of kind of general like, development of discontent towards Ottoman um, policies, and particularly the, the authority of Jamal Pasha during the war. Um, if you're going to, I guess, you know, identify three particular things that led to this, you can say that um, the attitude and the approach that Jamal Pasha had taken um, as a military commander attempting to um, deal with what he saw very clearly as a sort of you know, existential threat to the Ottoman Empire. Um, you know, dealing with potential fifth columnists, um, rewarding those who might be loyal, but also punishing extensively those who might be potentially disloyal, was a very important thing in terms of keeping the empire you know, intact, at least in this very sort of strategically important area in Syria. Um, so, interestingly enough, it seems that the Germans, um, you know, Lehman von Sanders, um, had expressed some concerns about Jamal's approach to this particular um, you know, region that he was ruling. Um, but it seems also that Jamal kind of relished his notoriety because it did give him some credibility when dealing with some of these problems as well. Um, another issue is the issue of the famine. Um, you know, starting kind of mid-1915, um, <coughs> as a result of a number of uh, kind of overlapping factors, um, famine had begun to spread mainly in Mount Lebanon, but as people then flooded the streets of you know, Beirut, Nosaida, you know, Tripoli, and many sort of um, adjoining areas, um, it became a very sort of apparent thing in the areas around. Um, as the war went on, the situation worsened. Um, economic factors then lead to these terrible social events. Um, so between the fact that you know, the Ottomans were clearly not responding to this in a sort of effective way, um, and the fact that, for the most part, you no know, news about what was happening in the rest of the country was very constricted because of censorship in the publications. Most people got their information through things like, say, rumor. Um, you know, Edward Nicoli, um, who was a professor here at the, um, during the war, had said, you know, these are the days that, where we can trust um, you know, one quarter of what we um, hear, um, one half of what we, oh geez, sorry, I've forgotten the quote, um, uh, like one half of what we see, uh, one half of what we say, and three quarters of what we actually see ourselves. Um, now the situation was a very sort of difficult thing, so many people were res receiving information and that defined their opinion of the situation and of the Ottoman authorities. They were based, you know, for the most part, on the sort of kind of worst case scenarios that were you know, roaming around the country um, through rumors and things like this. 
Um, on top of this, of course, you did have the issue of mismanagement, corruption, and the fact that the state itself was not doing very well. Um, and I won't dwell too much on this right now because I'm kind of limited in time, uh, but we'll get to this in just a moment. Um, so in terms of the narrative, um, the characters are actually a very important part of this. Um, you know, Jamal Pasha is this perfect sort of example um, as a sort of kind of like arch villain that one can have in these narratives. Um, Jamal, in many cases, became representative of many of the sort of, di I guess, feelings of discontent that people in the local populations have had. And in fact, if you read memoirs, um, the vast majority of memoirs that have been written about the wartime periods, um, for the most part, or the ones that mention them, um, tend to include the war in maybe one to two pages. Um, if you're going to select maybe four things that are pretty commonly found in these things, um, you have the Safarbarlik, you have the Allied blockade, you have the Locusts, and you have the arrival of Jamal Pasha and the authority, author, sort of authoritarian um, approach that he took to um, the country. Um, so within these sort of stories that came out of this, you have the sort of mythos of the sort of kind of oppressive, kind of, kind of dark villain of Jamal. Um, you know, stories are told about um, Jamal's attitude towards people who are starving. Um, the story about him you know, traveling through Sad Nile in the Bekaa Valley, and you know, Antoine Dumin talks about locals coming out there with the black bread that they're forced to eat because nobody has access to you know, good you know, white wheat bread anymore. The locals come out and they pelt him with this black bread, and you know, a man stands up and yells at him and says, no, you know, look at us, you Turks, look at what you've reduced us to. Um, the question of the word Turks, I'm going to focus on again in a little bit, um, but Jamal again is a sort of focal point of this. Um, another one of these stories comes out um, in a tale that Jamal has traveled to a small village and he's received by a group of local notables. Um, they beg him, you know, the, the country is starving, there's a famine out there, and Jamal sits back, and the location of the story, um, depending where you read it, um, could either be in the south of Lebanon, in the Baka, um, in Kura, um, the location is kind of indeterminate, um, various storytellers were used to kind of just emphasize the point about Jamal's character in this case. Um, Jamal sits back and asks the question, you know, has a mother eaten her son? And the leaders in the village are sitting back and they say, well, no, no she hasn't. He said, well, there's no real famine until a mother eats her son. So this is repeated in many sources and it's very likely this never actually took place. Um, but it's a great story and it really does kind of go to show um, how people perceive Jamal um, within these stories and how they're trying to convey him. You know, Jamal as a character has great value in these sorts of stories. Um, if you want to read some really fantastic tales of this, um, which you don't have time to tell, um, Tarif Khalidi and my son Sukariya have a story about, uh, an um, article about uh, Milham Qasim, one of the great uh, bandits in Lebanese history, and Jamal Pasha, the character, plays a very fascinating, active role in them. So, the sort of elites within the Ottoman administration, no, Jamal Azmi Bey, um, no, Muhyiddin Bey, the uh, police chief, um, no, play the role of these sort of kind of villainous characters. Um, and you know, as this conference also talks about the sort of relationship between the elite and the center, um, it's actually important to note actually that the elites within Lebanese or, or Beiruti society in particular were actually caught up in this as well. Um, when the war began um, and Jamal Pasha came um, to Beirut, he was you know, met and feeded by the Greek Orthodox elites. Um, Aziz Bey, um, who was the head of um, you know, Niamh Nalam at the time, you know, reports on this sort of kind of relationship they tried to establish with him very early on in the war. Um, essentially showing him that you know, we're here to kind of assist you with this whole project. And for the most part, the elites did play a very important role as intermediaries during the war. Um, unfortunately for them, um, Although many of these elite families, um, the Sursuk, Stehums, um, and others, attempted to kind of, you know, in certain cases, buffer the sort of effects of the upper administration on the local populations, um, you know, in many cases by distributing patronage, um, because of their association with Jamal Pasha, the family names in many cases got dragged through the mud as well. Um, you know, the hatred of the state was then transferred onto the, these individuals. And while there definitely was lots of profiteering that took place um, at various levels, uh, to some extent, um, again, this fits into the more sort of the idea of the memory and sort of um, you know, kind of collective storytelling about the period, um, and I think that's kind of the value of this. Um, so, one question I guess is when we deal with these sorts of issues, um, you know, are we talking about you know, an issue with accuracy? Now, as Salim brought up you know, yesterday, um, you know, Azmi Bey at least was making an attempt 
to kind of appeal to the Ottoman authorities to deal with some of the crises that were going on in Beirut, at least by 1917. Uh, but really, if you look at the you know, kind of in, the entire period of the war, you can see that even as early as the January of 1915, the Ottoman authorities were trying to deal with the sort of kind of beginnings of these crises that were forming in the streets. Um, you know, with the Allied blockade, the you know, most normal avenues for you know, commerce were cut off completely. Um, you know, seeing the potential for, um, I guess, you know, shortages in certain parts of the country, the elites in, in Damascus and the city council basically cut off shipments of grain to places like you know, Mount Lebanon and Beirut as a way to make sure that their areas didn't suffer. Um, the elites in Beirut appealed to Jamal and suggested that this was going to create a thought of crisis, and in fact it did. Um, Jamal interceded on their behalf and tried to then continue the shipments. Um, it was actually because of this that you had the kind of notorious flower cartel set up in the Sursuk family in order to make sure that Beirut had access to flour during the war. Um, and this is actually indicative of a lot of the approaches the state initially took. Um, the state, you know, when Azmi Bey in particular came in to Beirut in August of 1915, one of the first things he did was actually to cut off any of these charitable distribution programs that exist in the city. Um, for the most part, they wanted to deal with the issue through the state itself, um, oftentimes through, say, structural adjustments, um, you know, giving out you know, work programs, um, renovating the racetracks, um, knocking down chunks of the city center and rebuilding it. Um, in order to provide people with jobs, but again to kind of funnel this through the patronage of the state. And this is actually a somewhat common um, sort of approach, um, and it's very difficult to actually really predict famine. Retrospectively, we could look back and say, well, there were three and a half years of famine, they should have done something. But in 1915, when the famine is starting, it's often very difficult to really understand the severity of this, or even the length of the, the period you're dealing with. Um, so, in 1917, though, this changes a bit more, um, but the, I think the problem for the Ottoman authorities, especially in this narrative, is the fact that once you've established this sort of apparently uncaring relationship, um, where the Ottomans tried to initially defer to you know, pre-existing charities and things like this, rather than take a more active hand in actually giving out you know, direct aid, um, the exception of Amar Daouk and then um, Asmi Bey had a number of soup kitchens set up in 1917, um, the optics of the situation are very bad. Um, the appearance is, in this case, Know, for many people, more important than the actual sort of reality of the situation. Um, one other question, I suppose, when you're getting into this too, is that while Jamal Pasha is the sort of kind of central focus of many of these kind of memoirs and recollections, um, many of the problems people had with the Ottoman administration were actually on a lower level. And this kind of gets the sort of part of what I um, had kind of mentioned is the central theme of this um, paper, um, that somewhat deviated from. Um, Many of the issues people had were really with the sort of interactions they had on the interface with the empire. This wasn't Jamal Pasha. You know, the vast majority of people never saw Jamal Pasha. Um, what they did see was low-level bureaucrats, um, soldiers, gendarmes, and people like this, who engage in relations with the state you know, by enacting state policy or, in certain cases, you know, trying to you know, keep themselves alive. Um, one of the major issues in this was the fact that the Ottoman state was in major sort of fiscal dire straits, um, as we saw yesterday in um, presentation, um, Ottoman revenues were you know, essentially very difficult to come by at this time, especially in the local municipal level. Um, Yusuf al-Hakim, um, who was you know, in the empire during the war, talks about um, the sort of effect that this had on local salaries. Uh, people who were normally accustomed to being paid in Ottoman gold were being paid in paper money. And as you know, the paper money itself began to lose value, uh, by the end of the war it was worth you know, roughly you know, well, I guess by November of 1917, is worth roughly one fifth of its nominal value. People had to actually then, you know, find some way to make ends meet. Um, during this, because you had a, an influx of wealthy individuals, especially coming from Mount Lebanon, rents in the city actually increased. Uh, many people lost their jobs or were then, you know, kicked out of their homes. And so the general effect of this actually was that the cost of living, in addition to the food, actually went up um, just to actually, you know, like have a house and to exist in the city. Um, so if you're a bureaucrat, what do you do with this? Well, um, if you're a gatekeeper to some sort of you know, access to, like, say, you know, state policy or um, some institution, um, generally corruption, bribery, and things like this was a way that they adapted to keep themselves um, you know, afloat. Um, there's a story about you know, some individuals who were trying to transport a cow into Mount Lebanon, and they were stopped at the border by a soldier who then measured the cow. Um, because the cow you know, met the general sort of standards to be confiscated by the Ottoman state, um, you know, the soldiers confiscated. You know, the owner of the cow went then to the <coughs> sergeant who was in charge of the group of soldiers and passed him enough money to suggest that perhaps the cow wasn't quite that size. 
um, the sergeant, responsive to this sort of encouragement, came and not only remeasured the cow and found that the cow was actually not the size that it was initially intended, but then he beat the soldier who had measured the cow um, just to kind of ensure that, that things were dealt with properly. Again, memoir story and the sort of you know, attempts to kind of make points here. Um, so between this, you know, the, the sale of ration tickets um, by those individuals trying to kind of um, you know, dispense patronage um, for food that essentially should have been given as relief, um, things like this, um, many people begin to view the state as being more problematic than not. Um, many of the Ottoman policies as well that were enacted by these people on the ground tended to have the opposite effect that they had intended to. Um, one of the most, I guess, notorious of these was something that was called the blockade of Mount Lebanon. Um, this generally was a description of anti-smuggling policies that were intended to keep people from basically bringing food into the mountain and hoarding it, um, thus you know, causing a rise in price across um, the empire, or at least in the area. Um, what this wound up doing essentially was that it gave people who had the rights to access these sort of permission you know, papers to bring food into the mountains, um, basically the right to bring whatever they wanted to and smuggle, whereas most people who needed to bring food in, like say from coastal regions, were unable to do so. Um, Mount Lebanon consumed something like 20 million kilos of wheat, and it produced about 2 million locally, according to um, you know, Haki Bay's um, sort of compendium. So, for most people, you know, they had to adjust this in some way or another. Um, for them, you know, the blockade of the mountain, as they portrayed it, was a direct assault upon Mount Lebanon. You know, why would you know, Jamal Pasha be concerned about Mount Lebanon? You know, for many people, um, the way this is portrayed in memoirs was because of the sort of politics of the mountain before, um, the sort of independence of the Mutsarafiyya, um, the fact that um, you know, to some extent they had been kind of, ir kind of irritations to the Ottoman state before this, and, of course, because they were Christians in majority. Um, so, you know, for many people, this allowed them to kind of internalize the famine as well and make this into a sort of attack upon themselves. Thus, the memoirs and these narratives that are portrayed, in many cases, are very personal. Um, is essentially a sort of reflection of the sort of trauma that they're dealing with as well. Um, so, this wasn't something that was just applicable in the mountains as well, though. Um, if you read um, Bachet and Tamimi's um, Salami of the Belayat of Beirut, um, again, when they come through, many of the local municipalities that were dealing with these shortfalls in revenue had to deal with it in some way or another. Um, they couldn't continue on just, you know, say, going business as usual. Um, when they came to Tyre, the mayor of the city came and complained to them and said, well, you know, we're given 3,000 lira per year, or sorry, 3,000 gasters per year to deal with burials. So, you know, because of this typhus epidemic and these people coming in from Mount Lebanon, um, who, you know, nowadays you might consider the people of Mount Lebanon to be Lebanese, but if you are the mayor of Tyre, they are outsiders coming into your city. Um, within a three-month period, they had gone through the entire year's revenues for pauper burials. Um, and he began making these sort of, kind of, pleas to these representatives of the Ottoman authorities to help them deal with this crisis. Um, when at the Saida, um, a similar situation was going on. The poverty of the city and the, the effect of this kind of flood of refugees into the town had forced the city council to deal with it in a sort of creative way. So one would think that when you're having a crisis like a famine, that one of the priorities of the state would be then to you know, give out aid and try to get people you know, kind of alive and off the streets. So this wasn't really the case. If you think about this, I guess, on a bureaucratic level, the important thing for the mayors of the city was salaries. You have to pay your people. Um, another important thing was sanitation, education, and health care. So, during a time of crisis and famine, they actually cut charitable aid in order to kind of maintain these, what they saw as being the sort of core bureaucratic aspects of the state. Um, again, you know, this wasn't necessarily the Ottoman state's attempt to attack the local population, as in many cases is reported in these sort of popular narratives and um, memoirs. Um, is the Ottoman state trying to deal with local issues or sort of, I guess, you know, kind of countrywide issues? Um, in ways that just happen to have a negative impact on local populations. Um, certain things that tended to also discredit the Ottomans, such as the dealing with the dead. Um, in the city of Beirut, you had a cart that traveled through the city three times a day starting in 1916, and they would pick people up, um, like in Monty Python, throw them onto the back of the cart, and unceremoniously dump them um, initially into the sea. Um, presumably, they began washing up on the coasts and started bothering people. So after this, they began transporting them to the sands um, to the south of the city and burying them allegedly in mass graves. Um, because all of that is actually currently built up on, I'm actually curious how many 
apartment buildings are currently standing on mass graves, um, just in the wartime period. Um, given the fact that about 45,000 people allegedly died in Beirut during the famine, um, it might be somewhat substantial. Um, so, again, for the most part, we're dealing with the issues of optics and memoir. How do we remember these periods? And then you know, what does it mean to the people who then you know, have to deal with it? Um, so, one of the things I've been looking at lately actually has been the effects, um, I guess, the sort of memories of kind of resistance and smuggling. Um, one of the things that during the wartime periods, um, certain individuals, um, particularly in places like, say, um, Egypt and America, who are looking at the situation, hearing these reports of this massive crisis and people starving in the streets and just laying down to die you know, with grass coming out of their mouth, you know, the question was, you know, like, the Lebanese are laying there as victims. How can they just accept this passively, you know, accept this oppression from these you know, allegedly oppressive Turks and just lay down and let this happen? Um, in these retrospective na uh, narratives, um, particularly kind of oral histories and local histories, um, tell me how much time we have. About 12 minutes. Okay. Um, they kind of are reorienting the idea that the Lebanese, or at least certain individuals within these stories, were these passive individuals accepting death. Um, in certain cases, they might you know, deal with the local population on a sort of general level. You know, Whereas the majority of people lay down to passively accept death, the characters in this one particular story did not. Um, and here we again, I guess, get to the value of stories in some of these sort of retrospectives, and that's the value of story as fable. Now, what is you know, the moral of the story, and what can we get out of this? Um, you know, when we deal with the issue of, I guess, you know, people who violated Ottoman laws, especially very unpopular ones, like you know, the you know, quote-unquote blockade of the mountain, now the smugglers tend to be regarded in sort of heroic terms. Um, we can maybe suggest that uh, this is a sort of kind of re-remembering of the past. Um, those smugglers, in many cases, of course, are bringing wheat into the mountain. You know, yes, for their families, but also to sell. Um, and generally at a bit of an inflated price, because you have to take into account the amount of risk that goes into these sort of operations as well. Um, but some of these narratives are actually very sort of like pointed. And they very much pit the, you know, the smugglers themselves as sort of representatives of these local communities seeking to save their, themselves, seeking to save their local communities um, against the antagonists of these you know, oppressive Ottoman Turks. You know, those soldiers who are stationed at the sort of, you know, kind of outskirts of the mountains to prevent people from coming in. Um, in one particular story, um, one smuggler, Jamul Mahmoud, um, normally would go down to see these sort of cedars of Baruch, off into the Haran, collect the wheat, and then come back up the backside of the mountain using these uh, very sort of kind of secretive smuggling passes that no one but his family knew. So in the winter of 1916 to 1917, you had an exceptionally snowy and an exceptionally cold winter, and the pass was closed. Now, as he and you know, his herd of muleteers were coming up the mountain, um, they had to pass through the main pass of Dahl Baidar in order to actually get then up to the mountain. Um, the problem was that this was one of the places where we actually had an Ottoman checkpoint at the very sort of top of the pass. Um, so Mahmoud waits until you know, you know, the dead of night, it's pitch black, and it's freezing. You know, he slowly leads these, you know, this mule train up the mountain, and he sneaks ahead on his own. This is a very sort of you know, you know, cloak and dagger, James Bond sort of situation. And he goes up and he peeks out, and because it's so cold, the Ottoman soldiers, um, or gendarmes, are currently in the guard shack. So, kind of displaying even more bravery, he sneaks up to them and takes his staff and slides it through the handles of the door. So, you know, if they hear anything, they're going to be stuck inside there. Then comes down, signals to his men, they pass on, and you know, as the story goes, they save their community. Um, and you know, in the end, Jamul wound up making a bit of extra money and um, you know, kind of being able to buy a little bit, bit of land afterwards. Um, so the moral of the story really is you know, that you know, while many people are you know, kind of laying down to die, those who kind of take the initiative, um, you know, seize the sort of agency of the situation, and actually do something that you know, kind of contradicts these unpopular laws, you know, these are the ones who survive, whereas those who you know, don't are the ones who are lying in their bellies on the grass, you know, and bellies on the ground with grass in their mouth, you know, dead in the fields. Um, so I suppose as the memoirs themselves are essentially reinterpreting this sort of situation, I'm trying to look at them in their own reinterpretations to try to understand exactly what this means. Now, why do we remember the period of World War I, a hundred years later, in such sort of kind of starkly anti-Ottoman terms. You know, what is the political or sort of personal value to being anti-Ottoman a hundred years later? 
Um, and looking at these stories, not necessarily, I guess, as sort of transmission of facts, but as a sort of, I guess, transition, transmission of value and identity, I think this is an interesting way to kind of look at this period and try to understand really what's kind of going on in these memories of you know, the Ottomans as these oppressive um, sort of Turkish figures. Um, so anyways, I'll stop before okay. I cut off. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Except, uh, excuse me, can you get out of the way? I want to speak to my friend. Uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting, but uh, how do we explain all this death? How do we explain all these photographs of this, this horrible scenes? I mean, this happened, right? Of course. I mean, sure, people exaggerate it, but what the hell is going on? You know? well, well, that's the thing. I don't think that we're really talking necessarily about, I mean, the numbers themselves might be exaggerated. Um, you know, reading, like, say, Tobulsi's um, you know, book on the war, there's discussion about half the population at Lebanon dying during the war. Um, from what we can tell, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, the issue of numbers is something that's problematic because you know, all the numbers are essentially estimations. But just because half the people didn't die doesn't mean that it wasn't absolutely horrible and traumatic. Um, you know, I think many of us at this point kind of agree that probably about, you know, maybe over the course of the entire Mount Lebanon, we're talking maybe 22 to 25 percent of the population. Um, well, that's not 50 percent. You know, if we think about that in terms of just, you know, the general sort of like effects this has on society, you know, of the people up here, that means one of us is dead. Um, this is something that people dealt with on a daily basis. Um, this is a, a truly horrifying experience. And, you know, certain communities were afflicted far more badly than others. Um, no, some areas in Mount Lebanon disappeared entirely. Um, no, the populations in Beirut increased substantially during the war, Tripoli as well. Um, and when people went around to the city, you know, we were talking about a situation that you know, you're literally seeing, you know, you know, going from like say 1915, I guess a good um, sort of anecdote for this, um, in George Nakhdesi's discussion of the war, he talks about how you know, people had to deal with a sort of, I guess, issue of trauma and death in their daily lives. He says, you know, 1915, we'd go about the streets, and if we saw somebody falling to the ground from hunger and thirst, everyone would rush to his side, they'd pick him up, they'd give him some water, some food, and some durhams, and send him on his way when he felt better. He said, by 1916, you would walk through the streets with men and women and children lying in the mud on both sides of the roads, begging for some sort of assistance, and you would just go on continuing your conversation as if nothing was happening. Um, those effects of normalization of crisis in people's daily lives you no, know, for most people, this kind of took place. Um, but of course, for those who actually lived you know, through the famine, lived through the periods, you know, saw their family members dying um, in horrible ways. I mean, the famine is the worst, the you know, sort of kind of social crisis you can possibly imagine. Um, you you see those who you know in your sort of kind of personal lives transforming from you know, your friends and you know, kind of you know, relations, you know, into you know people who are suffering and in terrible pain just from even existing. Um, so this certainly happened, um, and the sort of, I guess, you no know, questioning of the sort of severity of it or, I guess, you know, the role of the Ottoman state isn't necessarily to diminish the sort of suffering or the fact that, you know, or to suggest that it didn't happen to a certain extent. Um, we're kind of looking at the sort of, I guess, I guess, you know, effects of it, though, um, from a sort of kind of narrative standpoint, uh, but also even to a certain extent, I guess, kind of really figure out, you know, to what extent really did this happen? You know, is exaggerating the death tolls you know, providing us any sort of additional sort of, I guess, understanding about the period? Um, so again, I'm not really coming out and suggesting that it didn't happen or that it wasn't bad. In fact, the significant chunk of what I actually write about is actually you know, the trauma of the period itself and then people trying to deal with the trauma in their own sort of, kind of internal sort of understanding of themselves in relation to society. Um, to some extent, I think that, you know, that's perhaps, you know, I guess, just as bad whether you had, you know, 100,000 people dying or 200,000. So, I don't know if that's really answered your question, but. Uh, well, the, uh, areas in Mount Lebanon, you see Mount Lebanon was affected most. Mm -hmm. Were the areas all the same? I mean, uh, the Shuk, 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 the Sh
No, in fact, from what we can tell, the Kisarwan tended to be the worst affected. Um, you know, Mount Lebanon tended to get most of its grain, you know, pretty much at the, during the time of the war, from Anatolia, Palestine, or from the sort of surrounding areas. Depending on where you were in Mount Lebanon, your access to grain, you know, kind of varied. Um, in addition, you know, certain communities tended to have a bit more money than those. And say, if you had a land tenure system in your community that you know, was more, I guess, prone to giving you access to, like, say, spending money, then this would help you kind of keep yourself going throughout the war. If there was a wealthy patron in your community, um, for instance, in Boromana, um, you had the Cortez family, and then um, you know, Arthur Gray moved in, and with the patronage of Jamal Pasha, the Ottoman army, the Germans, etc. Well, the reason I'm saying this yeah. is because uh, I come from the Shufat. Mm -hmm. yeah. My mother was born in uh, yeah. 1914, mm -hmm. so my father must have been much older. And I heard from my grandfather, they were not hungry in Mahli, for instance. They were never hungry. There were some people who left to Hauran, mm -hmm. and they uh, smuggled uh, grain from Hauran. So they were not really that hungry. They were happy people, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. would come from different places, pass through and then come to Beirut. Yeah. So it wasn't equal. Definitely. I think that actually in the case of the Druze community, the fact that they did have the Hauran actually gave them a major advantage during the war. Um, in addition, I think the sort of, I guess, social sort of support systems within the Druze community was also a bit better. And I think that when you talk about you know, surviving and trying to deal with crisis, you know, the support networks that existed within communities really were incredibly important. Probably because of uh, Hauran and yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so getting food was, you know, I think a, a bit easier in that sort of respect. Um, the the Kisarwan also is, you know, a bit more foreboding in certain cases in as well. You know, the communities are kind of more disconnected, um, and it seems as though, you know, the poverty was much more difficult to deal with. Um, essentially, for support systems, you know, in the Hora, uh, sorry, in, in the Shuf, you did have, you know, the Druze communities. Um, you had um, some networks set up you know, by, like, say, the Americans, um, the college here in particular, and the Red Cross. In the Kisar Wan, you didn't really have that. In fact, in certain areas, they rejected the American assistance outright. Um, the Maronite Patriarchate did have you know, some funds to deal with this, um, but as some of the historians of the war have suggested, um, there's an obligation that if someone came asking for assistance, that they had to pay it out. So the problem is that when you have tens of thousands of people who are in a dire state, um, if not hundreds of thousands, when you begin paying out to each one of them, you know, what happens? So you deplete your funds rather quickly and you know, people wind up dying. Um, so you know, the whole situation was incredibly complex. I mean, whenever you're dealing with the famine, it's not about you know, the lack of food, it's really more about the lack of, I guess, access. Um, the lack of you know, funding and you know, the inability to then on a personal level you know, confront these challenges in your daily life. You, know, you have you know, epidemics breaking out and things like this. Um, it's incredibly complicated. Um, you know, in two towns that might be, like, say, you know, three kilometers apart in the mountain, might have completely different experiences um, based on any number of kind of random factors. Um, any more questions? Uh, thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to quickly come back to this question of um, the mother eating her babies, or rather yes. not. Um, because it, it struck me that there's something interesting going on there around a kind of honor game that's mm -hmm. being played, um, yeah. potentially, and that maybe you, you can say a lot more about. Um, that, I mean, in the story, if we accept that this, that this didn't actually happen, mm -hmm. um, the Jamal Bash is saying, to this group of people, he's essentially offering them a choice. He says, either you can accept your part of the people within which no mothers have eaten their babies, mm -hmm. but and that means I'm not going to give you any food, mm -hmm. or you can say, we are part of the people, which contains mothers who eat babies, <laughs> uh, which is this massive kind of loss of honor yeah. and, and this enormous of admission. And then he might be willing to give them some food. Maybe. So maybe, you know, maybe not even that. But, you know, there's this, this sense of how much are you willing to concede in order to get this material good, in some sense. And that that is as much what's being portrayed there as a question of the, you know, the question of whether there is a real famine or not. I don't know if that's what you had in mind. Yeah. I mean, I have another example in mind. In the, in the 1820s, you know, I've worked on this, there's, um, there's a moment at which the, um, 
it's got the governor of, um, of, of Tripoli who's trying to disarm Christians along the coast. Mm. And the Christians, supposedly in the story, they say, we won't give up your ar our arms, we'd rather give up our women. Because if you, you take our arms, then someone else will come and they can take our women. So it's this massive concession of honor to be without arms. Yeah. Yeah. This sort of <laughs> discourse, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it seems similar. Logical <laughs> conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think this is really the, the key. I mean, yeah. No, I think this is really the key. I mean, like these stories, you know, again, whether or not they actually happened, especially the the mother eating your child story. You know, this this one had enough currency to be repeated in at least five different stories and to allegedly have taken place in you know various locations across the mountain um, or in you know, in the Janub too. Um, so the commentary here is in part, again, you know, on the nature of Jamal Pasha and the Ottoman administration, um, seeing it, I guess, as a sort of kind of you know, cold, and unfeeling sort of you know, state. Um, but as you note, too, there's a value here then that these locals are also carrying with them as well. I mean, you know, again, the idea of cannibalism is something that's truly horrifying. And, um, and it was something that tended to also crop up in these stories. Um, you know, it, there are maybe two cases that we actually have pretty good evidence that somebody actually ate someone else during the time, and, or at least killed them to eat them. Um, allegedly, there are police records in Tripoli. Um, I won't tell the story, it's fascinating. Uh, maybe dinner tonight. Um, it's a more appropriate menu, I think. Um, and a case in, um, in uh, Damur, um, where apparently a couple of kids were taken up. Um, there were stories of people who dug up graves to eat them, but this is the sort of representation of sort of kind of the most extreme and sort of, I guess, like terrible circumstances possible. These are people who have abdicated their humanity. Those sort of like the final taboo in order to actually then, you know, to keep themselves alive. So I think that your point there is really relevant. Um, you know, there's a lot of value being carried in this story that goes beyond simply just the sort of kind of Ottoman, non-Ottoman dynamic. Yeah. So thank you. Bye. I hope we'll not end on this uh, happy note of famine. Yeah, no. <laughs> you, this was this was his fault for can designing. Can you come it. up? I, I will, yeah, I should have put you mm. oh, okay. <laughs> come before up. lunch, maybe. Before lunch. Come up and <laughs> tell them about dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a happier note. Tell them what. Do uh, um, you have any so uh, announcements you want so to make? We're actually done, uh, technically speaking, right? So we thank you first thank of all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.